and some good news. Uh, so the bad news is for those people uh, who were at the Warwick Medicine Conference recently, I'm really sorry, it's the second sector. Uh, and uh, for those people who are the NYU PSP people, that's the second bit of bad news. I'm sorry again, it's uh, the same paper. Uh, and, uh, and the only bit of good news is I'm going to give you the shorter version rather than the longer version. So hopefully uh, it won't be too painful. I would have liked to have given another paper, but Alexandra Gethin, she insisted I gave the paper on the program, and as I told her, she's so scary that there's no way I was going to do anything different. Uh, okay, so this is a paper about voting, and uh, a couple of nights ago, uh, Steve uh, gave me that wonderful insight about the definition of political science, right? Uh, which is, if you can vote for it, I'll study it, he said, which I am always going to carry around with my final life from now on. Because thinking about voting, the one most central act that we have in any political situation is really, I guess, one of the most important things we do. Thinking about why people vote and for whom they vote. And in some cases, people insist on voting for people who really suck, right? So I'll take as an example here. This is uh, Caroline Lucas. And Caroline Lucas is the leader of the UK's uh, Green Party. So this is somebody who's you know, perfectly nice, perfectly great, but you sure as hell don't actually want her to be elected in an power. But nevertheless, she attracts a lot of votes, because the issue of the party she represents captures people's concern, in this particular case, the Green Party, for the environment. So a lot of people vote for the Green Party. In fact, Caroline Lucas actually achieved uh, a seat uh, in the uh, UK Parliament. Uh, but in this particular uh, particular case, you don't really want them to form a government. Another example of that from the United Kingdom recently uh, is this chap. You can probably see his face down there, but that's uh, Nigel Farage, who is leader of the UK Independence Party, and he really is a complete nutcase in many ways. <laughs> Uh, uh, but represents an issue that a lot of people uh, sort of care about, which in this particular case is they care about the European Union. So we have people voting for people who don't actually want to actually win power, who really wouldn't want these guys to win power, but at least by voting for them we're expressing something to do with uh, that we care about the European Union. Sorry, uh, Nick Clegg uh, from the Liberal Democrats. So again, sometimes these people have been home for those votes where people don't really want the power but perhaps want to express dissatisfaction. In this particular case, Nick Clegg is from the UK Liberal Democrats, and see people are expressing their enthusiasm for earnest and confidence <laughs> being the key, uh, the key issue. So I see these as possible examples of issue-driven protest votes where people switch away from perhaps a high-quality or reasonable uh, candidate that they don't otherwise support in order to express support for a particular issue. But we know that protest votes for minor parties or single-issue parties, or in some cases parties who would not need to be out <laughs> Still here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so these are Sometimes they will deviate not to vote for another third party candidate, but instead to spoil their ballot papers. Oh gosh, I'm, I'm slightly out of order with my slides here, so I'm going to spoil my ballot papers first, like this. So people say, oh, I'm going to spoil my ballot paper, and then we'll turn off engaging the costly act of voting, but for no vote for nobody by taking the ballot paper and actually kind of spoiling it. As an example of that, we're going to sign over here. The camera follows me around. The camera follows me over here. So we have an example of a uh, <laughs> kind of thing. So you see, you can't video it because I'm big. You see, like that. So I'm going to go back. So people will engage in small part papers. Okay, so here we are. What do we have with these kind of examples? So let's go back to this recent example from the UK Independence Party. That's Nigel Farage on the left. He wants to leave the European Union. And uh, David Cameron, current UK Prime Minister, on the right. So we go back to 2006, and David Cameron, uh, commenting on the UK Independence Party, very succinctly and accurately, uh, described them <laughs> as a bunch of fruitcakes, loonies, and closet racists, mostly, which frankly is, is how I see them. <laughs> and, and so you can see that consistently that, that recently the UK uh, Independence Party in local elections in Britain uh, you know, captured a quarter of the popular vote. But nevertheless, Cameron stuck to his guns and said, we need to show respect to these people who have taken the choice to support this party and to work really hard to win them back. <laughs> so we've got a switch in position where, in fact, of course, 
the major person of power has now engaged with the issue represented by that single issue. Where is the for which people work out. <laughs> okay, so these are all examples of what I think about as, uh, as uh, people engaging in protest votes for third party and other candidates. We see examples not just in Europe and the UK, but obviously the historical examples where we've seen third candidates even in uh, US elections, some of whom, but not all of them, associated sometimes with a particular issue, but others you might argue that in some cases people are expressing dissatisfaction with major candidates without actually wanting some of them to take power. So what I'm going to be doing in this paper is I'm going to be having a very, very simple model where I'm trying to capture the idea that people want a regular, normal incumbent candidate to win, but at the same time want to convey dissatisfaction to that candidate about a particular issue, or otherwise want to restrict that candidate's power. So in that case, that uh, risk, uh, vote against the candidate is going to be interpreted as a protest vote. So here's my basic game specification, and I'm only going to use a very simple version of the, the paper <coughs> in the talk today. I'm going to have N voters and a single incumbent candidate. So I'm going to have people either voting for the candidate or voting against the candidate. Where against could be stalling your ballot paper, voting for the opposition, voting for a single issue party. I'm going to lump all of those into one category for simplicity while recognising that I'd like to expand that dimension to multiple competing candidates later. They're all either going to vote for the candidate or against, against as a protest vote for the candidate's re-election. The incumbent is going to be re-elected if the fraction voting for her exceeds a particular bar. I call that P-bar, and normally P-bar you think there's a half, right? Half the electoral more, and she gets re-elected, but that can allow that to be different. And then what's going to happen is the incumbent, after seeing the election result, is going to decide whether to accept or ignore a protest issue. In the case of the UK, the UK Independence Party is attracting votes, trying to push forward the idea of a leaving the EU referendum or other leaving the EU actions. So I'm imagining now that David Cameron looks at the number of votes of the UK Independence Party and decides whether or not to accept their demands to move forward on that particular agenda as a function of the vote share. So the vote share communicates or induces something for the winning incumbent if she wins the election. What are the payoffs? Well, voters are supposed to the incumbent, right? So they want the incumbent to win, but they also want the incumbent, if she wins, to accept their protest. And they're going to have payoffs where a payoff if the incumbent loses, a payoff if she wins and accepts the protest, and another payoff if she wins the election but ignores their protest completely. And the payoff structure we've got is you'd rather she win and accept the protest but you don't want her to lose, so you don't want her out of power, but you also don't want her to ignore the protest issue. So this is the kind of key inequality in protest voting. For this talk, I'm going to have a large electorate, and I'm going to suppose that the bar that the candidate needs in order to win is just going to be a half. That's just going to simplify some statements of some results, but I have generality in the paper. And for now, but not later in the talk, not in about 10 minutes, I'm going to suppose that the incumbent candidate accepts the protesters', protesters demands if and only if her support is sufficiently small. So if her vote share she wins but by a small margin, she goes, I better accept the protesters' demands and give in to whatever they're actually saying. In 10 minutes, what I'm going to do is open up the candidate using the election result to learn about some state of the world. So they are actually uh, are micro foundations for why the candidate is uh, acting in that way. So let me just illustrate the payoffs to see how this thing works. So I've got a graph here, and on the bottom of my graph, I'm going to have the proportion of people who vote for the candidate, the incumbent candidate. That is not protest votes. So protest voting is over there on the left next to Tom, and happy voting for the candidate is home here next to me. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to imagine there's a line in the sand, that's the re election bar. P bar, I'll put it over here at 25%, but complete that as half, it's going to be half throughout the rest of the presentation. Um, and there's going to be another line in the sand, P star, and that's the critical support below which the candidate wins, but says, look, I'm going to give into the protest actually. They've indicated that on popularity, it's all fine, that's all we can do. Right. So, uh, so what we're going to have here, what are the payoffs? Well, there we've got the three outcomes. Candidate loses, candidate wins and accepts the protest, candidate ignores the protest, and the payoffs to the voter, well, they're low at two ends, and they're high in the middle. 
So the boaters really want to be in the middle of this environment where we get the win and the acceptance by the candidate of the protest is issue. If they're ignored, they don't like that, and they really don't want the candidate to actually lose. So in this situation, it's kind of interesting because voters face an anti-coordination incentive. They want to be in the middle. So if a lot of people are over here and you know, the candidate's doing really well, then maybe you want to vote against them. But if the candidate's doing really badly and they're going to lose, you don't want to vote against them, you don't want to protest, you want to make sure they actually get re-elected. So you want to push towards the middle. And as you push towards the middle, in usual voting logic, what you're really going to be doing is comparing the relative likelihood of different pivotal events. So you're going to be comparing the likelihood of being over here to the likelihood of being over here, and that's going to inform your voting calculus. So this is also related to some uh, other, this is kind of the inverse of papers by these guys. So if we go back to the 80s, we'll have people such as Gary and Tom thinking about issues of tactical voting, where people are trying to coordinate behind one candidate or coordinate behind another candidate in order to defeat an incumbent. In the paper you're giving, are you giving the paper with that paper? In the paper that's going to be coming up next, we have a rather sinister looking Alistair here, and a rather more relaxed looking you know, Bruce here, and they're going to be dealing with a, po uh, 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 a model in which people are, are deciding whether or not to vote for an incumbent, and they actually want to coordinate behind the incumbents or coordinate against the incumbent, and that's going to be what's happening in his paper. So these tactical voting areas are dealing with coordination problems. Whereas I'm dealing with an anti-coordination problem. So the problem of protest voting takes these coordinating voting problems and kind of turns them upside down. So you can kind of think conceptually, what I'm actually just doing uh, is getting these guys and turning them upside down. So I'm taking a picture like that, and if I go back to a tactical voting problem, a la Gary, Gary here, so we know about uh, the, uh, the, the, the Making Votes Camp book, if I think about the British context, we're kind of thinking about UK in 1997, where we think about the proportion of anti-Tory voters choosing between Labour and the Lib Dems. So we have an environment here where there are really some thresholds where if we all coordinate behind the Liberals, the Liberals win. If we all coordinate behind Labour, Labour win. But if we miss to coordinate, the nasty Conservatives get in. And the payoffs to the voters are high at the ends where we've got Labour and Liberal wins, and they're low in the middle where we've got Conservative wins. Uh, the next paper that's coming up, we're going to have a very similar picture, only Alice is going to be talking about oh gosh, uh, people uh, thinking about voting for a disliked incumbent, and he's going to have a structure where the incumbent either loses or wins and gives the voters a prize, or wins without giving them a prize. I'll let him talk, obviously talk about his own paper, but it's going to have the same kind of payoff structure. So these are coordination games where I'm dealing with an anti-coordination game. Well, <laughs> Sorry? Why do you call it a Simply anti-coordination because if other people are doing what I want to do opposite to everybody else rather than the same as everybody else. Uh, the way that Gary and I were talking yesterday, you would think about it as a uh, <coughs> like chicken game. Yes, with the, with the language rather than a hawk dove game, which is what uh, not, um well stack comes, thank you. Uh, which is why how you think about the other coordination scenarios. So what about voters' preferences? So here are the remaining elements of the model and I'll just tell you the results. Well, what's really going to matter for voters is how much they care about the candidate winning versus how much they care about the protest succeeding. And so what's really going to matter is the ratio of these two different things. So this is how much they care about the candidate winning, and this is how much they care about the candidate winning and accepting their processes rather than ignoring them. And it's the relative concern <coughs> for these two things that's going to drive their voting behaviour. So I'm going to define a voter's type as the log of that ratio. That's your log relative concern. And the model is going to uh, allow that to be variable across voters. It's going to be normally distributed. It's going to have a mean. And uh, the KI idea here is if your preference type is positive, that means you care more about the candidate winning than you do about the protest succeeding. I'm going to suppose that the average preference parameter represents the true popularity of the candidate, if you like, or the true enthusiasm for the candidate winning. So as UI goes up, that means I care more about winning, and I'm going to take the average to be uh, a parameter theta, and I'm going to suppose that that parameter theta is unknown, so voters are unsure what the popular support for the candidate is versus support for the protest. And so that's going to be drawn from some distribution of the mean and a variance parameter, and uh, so on and so forth.
Uh, in the actual uh, paper itself, I have put a rich model where I'll allow people to get signals of this unknown preference, underlying preference parameter. Uh, but in this particular talk, I'm just going to keep it very simple and suppose everybody shares this common belief about this underlying parameter, which is the average relative preference for the candidate versus preference for the protest. And the mean of that distribution is mu, that's going to represent the expected popularity of the candidate versus the popularity of the protest. So those are, all, those are all of the bits of the model. So now we're going to worry about what the vote is going to do and what's the outcome going to be. Well, uh, the only bit of analysis here, I'll only put one side of analysis before just telling you results, is that clearly a voter is going to use pivotal voting logic, and a voter is going to vote for the candidate rather than protesting if the payoff from getting a candidate win times the probability of being pivotal for the candidate. So P is the uh, vote share for the candidate when that's five equal to a half, that's been pivotal for the candidate's win, is going to be bigger than all well, the benefits of enabling the successful protests. So the candidate winning and accepting the protest rather than ignoring the protesters. And when am I pivotal for that? Well, it's when the popularity, the uh, proportion supporting the candidate is just equal to a critical threshold, P star, that determines the protest success or not. So I'm going to take payoffs and pivotal probabilities, and I'm going to rearrange them, and I'm going to cast the protest vote, if and only if the log ratio of these utility terms is less than the log like likelihood ratio of these pivotal events. And I can see John waving his hand in the back, so. So I understand why we have a threshold of one half, because that determines the outcome of the election. But why do the candidates have to either pay attention to you completely or ignore you completely? I'm going to, I'm going to endogenize that in just now five minutes. Um, what I'm going to do is, at the moment, I'm just saying I get 50% I win. I get 75% P stop. It's called P stop 75%. Right. Right. That's a landslide. Okay. 75.1% versus 74.9% look pretty similar. Uh, okay. So in that particular case, I have now got this, uh, so I, I am imagining a dis discrete change in policy. I allow uh, leaving the EU referendum or not, for instance, okay? I adopt the green policy or not, in which case there's going to be a threshold step beyond which I ignore the protesters. If the policy response of the incumbent is continuous, right? right then what would happen is I'm imagining a situation where as the uh, support for the candidate drops away, the candidate becomes more and more concerned with her popularity and so continuously changes the policy. Yeah. If I do that, then everything uh, that I say today is, is, is exactly the same, but the details will, it's the same in principle and message, but the details will simply change. So uh, I understand so it's a step for the re-election, it can be continuous for everything else. I don't think, where is this threshold coming from? At the moment it's arbitrary, right? But I'm going to endogenize it in just a moment. So I say, why does the candidate give into a protest if her support is low? And the reason is, she's going to take that support and use it to infer something about the world, which changes her policy decision. Okay, so she's going to cast a protest vote, a uh, voter, he is going to cast a protest vote if and only if his preference type is below some log uh, likelihood ratio of pivotal probabilities. So the equilibrium is going to take a simple form, your preference type is below a cutoff, and in equilibrium that cutoff has to be equal to the log, li uh, log likelihood ratio of pivotal probabilities. So my only job here is to characterize what that cutoff is, and then work out what the amount of protest voting is. Uh, how much is that amount of protest going to voting going to be? Well, you know, you're going to protest if your preference is below this cutoff. So the probability that you protest, 1 minus P, that is 1 minus the probability you vote for the candidate, so the probability of preference is below the threshold. If I write this for the CDF of the normal distribution, given everything's normal, given people's preference types are drawn from a distribution with mean theta, and given that you vote against the candidate below U star, this is the probability that you engage in a protest. So obviously the amount of protest voting is increasing in this threshold, and it's decreasing in the actual popularity of the candidate. Of course that reveals a source of strategic substitutes here. Because as the candidate becomes more popular, the amount of protest voting goes down, which means other voters think, oh, actually, I should increase my amount of protest voting because there's, I need more protest voting because the candidate's more popular, therefore other people are not engaging in protests. So an increase in candidate popularity, you're going to think, is going to push people in the direction of wanting to protest more. On the other hand, as an individual voter, if I think others are protesting more, so U star goes up, then that's going to increase the amount of the protest, and obviously that might drop my incentive, therefore, to engage in protest voting, and so I've got to resolve all of those in equilibrium. 
So what I do is I do a model where I form beliefs about the state of the world theta and the equilibrium of some energies U star, work out beliefs, work out pivotal probabilities, do all the calculations, and if I were really nasty, I'd tell you about all of those calculations because they're all really exciting for voting geeks, but I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm just going to tell you what the results are and what the message is from the first of two results are. So my first result is a, a, a characterization of equilibrium. Uh, rather than go through the complete solutions, I'm only going to show you a special case where a lot of the parameters have dropped out. So to recall, the model parameters I'm going to have here are that people's preferences are drawn from a distribution within the beta, a variance in sigma squared, that's the heterogeneity of voters' types, and we're uncertain of what the voters' uh, average type is, and that's got a mean of mu. So the key parameter here really is mu, which is the expected popularity of the candidate versus the process ex ante. So now let's have a look at what the equilibrium looks like. Well, the properties of the unique equilibrium are really straightforward. If I allow the precision of prior beliefs to become very precise, so that's going to be this parameter psi going to infinity there, then I can write down the solutions and fit them on a slide rather than having to complicate your algebra for you. So if I do that, if I'm just going to present them just for this one case, then it turns out that the equilibrium threshold below which you engage in protest voting converges to this expression. Now the interesting thing about this expression is it's decreasing in p-star. And that basically means that I've got a relationship here with the threshold that uh, the, uh, the candidate is using to respond to a protest. But the kind of interesting thing here, the more interesting thing, is it's one for one increasing in the ex ante expected popularity of the candidate. In other words, if ex ante you expect the candidate to be 1% more popular, right, then the threshold for protest voting goes up by 1%. And the candidate loses 1% of support. And in fact, if I translate that into the proportion of people who vote for the candidate, then I find P, the probability of the people who vote for the candidate, converges to this expression here, which depends only on this value P star, which is the critical line in the stand below which the protest is accepted. So the interesting thing about this is this is completely independent of the mean and variance of voters' preferences. So the outcome of the election and the support from the candidate is a completely different object from people's enthusiasm for the candidate and enthusiasm for the protest. Voting outcomes have got nothing to do with preferences. So first of really the two major results of the paper, uh, here are the conditions. Beliefs are common and uh, relatively precise to keep the formula simple. The fraction of people who protest does not demand, depend on the mean and variance and properties of voter preferences. Okay. Moreover, it turns out that the proportion of people who vote turns out to be, uh, for the candidate, it turns out to be above a half, so the candidate wins, but below this value P star, so it turns out that the protesters' demands are accepted. So in the UKIP case, the Conservatives in Britain still win the election, but they came into the UKIP's demands and actually go ahead and say, yeah, let's have an anti referendum later in the day. But I think the important message really is this one. No relationship between the outcome and voters' preferences. So now I'm going to give candidate power. So the candidate is going to look at the election outcome and she's going to use that to decide whether to accept the protesters' demand or, advance or not. And since she is now a player of the game, I've got to give her payoffs. So what are her payoffs? Well, I'm going to suppose that her payoffs for accepting the protesters' demands depend on the protesters' actual true preferences. So I'm going to actually have here a candidate for office who really cares about what the voters think. Now I realise that might be an outrageous assumption. So I've given this talk before and people have said that's completely ridiculous. The candidate, the candidate wins, you know, just cares about whatever the candidate cares about. So I'm not going to assume that. The fact I'm not, what I'm going to assume is that the candidate is amenable to accepting the protest if she thinks there's enough true underlying popular support for it. But she's not going to take the protest vote as a naive indication of that. She's going to infer the actual enthusiasm for the protest issue by inverting the election outcome and finding out what people really think about it. So technically what I'm going to assume is the candidate gets a payoff V of theta if she accepts the protest. Okay? So theta is the underlying true electorate's enthusiasm for the candidate rather than the protest. 
So if theta goes down, that means people care more about the protest issue. So what I'm going to assume very simply is that V of theta is positive, positive if and only if theta is less than some critical value in theta dagger. I'm not going to assume no other properties of the, uh, payoff of, the, uh, of the candidate. So the candidate is going to look at the election result and say, ah, there's the election result. Let me use that electorate result to work out what theta is, work out what the true state of voter preferences is. And if I think it's really low, so I think they really care a lot about the protest, then I'm going to say, yeah, I'll give in. I'll give it to the protesters and that. So here's the inference process of the, uh, the candidate. The candidate's going to say, oh, okay, look, the proportion of people who vote for me is going to depend on the underlying average preference time and the threshold below which they engage in protest voting. So they're going to say, look, you know, if people engage in a lot of protest voting, my popularity, my popularity is going to go down, but if they really like me, my popularity is going to go up. So I can understand in equilibrium what that threshold Q star is, and so I can use this relationship to invert the election result and, get a, a get a, a, and therefore infer what theta is. So what the candidate is going to do, as in any signal jamming model, is the candidate is going to infer theta from the strategies used by voters and from the proportion of people who vote for her in the election. Okay? So that means she's going to be more optimistic about people's enthusiasm for her when the number of people who vote for her goes up. But she's also going to be more enthusiastic about her, her popularity when the amount of protest voting goes up. So U star is indexing the amount, the degree to which people are willing to engage in protest voting. So that's kind of an interesting feature. It's a standard signal jamming kind of feature. If I think that people are engaging in a lot of protest voting, so if I think U star is very high, then I'm expecting a big protest vote. So that means if I get a moderately high vote share, I say, actually, I must be pretty popular, right? Because I was expecting a lot of protest voting, so actually things are not so bad. So therefore, the more protest voting there is, the more the candidate really feels that she's popular, and therefore people don't care so much about the protest. And so therefore, in some sense, anticipation of high protest voting in equilibrium uh, means that the candidate is less responsive to the protest. So I can put all these things together and say, well, what's the candidate going to do? Well, she's going to concede to the protesters if and only if she perceives her relative popularity as being below a threshold. That's going to be given on the election outcome. So if P is small, she's going to give in. But if U star is high, then she's not going to give in. So she expects a lot of protest voting. So here's the candidate's uh, 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 optimal candidate response. Is she accepts the protesters demands if and only if her support in the election is below P star, but now P star is endogenous. So the endogeneity is going to come about here, and one response to follow up to John's point at the end is some of the things that the degrees of uh, support that you need in order to get the protest to succeed or not are endogenous, so that's why some of the issues that you mentioned don't necessarily arise, but so sometimes they do, so let's not worry too much about that now. We've got P star, the line in the sand below which the protest succeeds depends negatively on the amount of the degree to which people are willing to engage in protest voting. They depend depends positively on how amenable the candidate is to the protest, and it also depends on the standard deviation of voters' preferences, but let's not worry about that. So that's the endogenous candidate response. And I'm going to put that together, and I'm going to find the final equilibrium where voters often engage in protest voting, but the candidate anticipates the amount of protest voting and decides whether to accept the protest, and we're going to see what happens. So here's the equilibrium. It says equilibrium 2. What's equilibrium 2? Well, one of the cases in the one half of the parameter space uh, is uh, the space where the candidate uh, doesn't really care very much about the protest, so the fact never gives into the protest and no action happens. So I'm going to deal with the other half of the parameter space. The other half of the parameter space is where the threshold of preference types below which the candidate is interested in conceding to the protest is positive. And in this, there is a unique equilibrium. And there's a unique equilibrium with a P star. That P star is bigger than a half, right? And all I'm going to do is find out what that P star is. Okay? Well, there are two cases. It turns out that if the expected popularity of the candidate is very high, then as I allow the precisions of beliefs to get very high, it turns out that that P star gets close to a half, which is essentially a world in which the protest is always ignored. But the really interesting case is this uh, other case, which is the sort of predominant case, 
uh, which is under this parameter restriction, and here's what happens. Okay, this is in this interesting case. If I write the precision of voters' beliefs to get very high, and that is purely to simplify the statements of the results on this slide, and for no other reason, then the threshold that voters use to engage in protest voting, u star, converges to this simple expression here. And the only thing you need to know about this expression is that the expected popularity of the candidate is multiplied by two. What does that mean? Well, that means that if the expected popularity of the candidate goes up by 5%, then people's willingness to engage in protest voting goes up by 10%. Right? Now, the expected popularity of the candidate is the inverse of enthusiasm for the protest. So that means that the amount of protesting or willingness to protest reacts two to one for enthusiasm for that protest and in the wrong direction. So in fact, when we actually work out what the proportion of people who engage in protest voting is when there's an endogenous candidate response, then it turns out in equilibrium, the proportion of people who vote for the candidate when beliefs are precise converges to this expression. This is the CDF, the standard normal. This is the candidate's willingness to accept the protest. Right. So the more the candidate is willing to think about accepting the protest, it turns out the greater the support for her. But here's the killer. The support for the candidate, the proportion of people who vote for the candidate, is negatively related to the popularity of the candidate, or the expected popularity of the candidate. Okay. So therefore, as a candidate becomes more popular, right, Therefore, enthusiasm for the protest goes down, right? The support for the candidate goes down and the amount of protest voting goes up. And the reason is there are two feedback loops. The first feedback loop is as protest voting goes up, people engage in less protest voting because they're strategic substitutes. But the second feedback loop is as protest voting goes up, the candidate takes protest voting less seriously. So if there are a bunch of people who are expected to engage in a protest at an election, a candidate says, look, you know, we know there's going to be a lot of protest voting in this election, so just because 20% of people voted against me, I don't need to take that too seriously. And that means voters are forced to engage in more protest voting to convey their message. And that force is so strong that you actually get protest voting increasing as the popularity of the protests falls. And that means that you, this environment, you can't necessarily think that the outcome of the election is any reflection of popularities of candidates or popularities of protest. So this fits into a literature where there's a bunch of related literature. You've seen some photographs already of some uh, voting guys and uh, some, uh, some nice work that's coming up with Alistair and Bruce. Not quite as nice as the next paper in that project. Uh, is going to be <laughs> so because uh, we're going to be we're we're sort of uh, we're uh, bringing together a whole bunch of models as well. Uh, but here are some authors who've been dealing with the topic as voting is communicating. So Tom Piketty uh, had a paper voting is communicating, where in an early election, people in a later election, voters in this particular case, use the early result to act as a coordination device in a later election. So the theme that's common there is the fact that votes have a role other than the short-term instrumental effect of determining the winner, they can influence the coordination of voters. Other papers, uh, and if, I, if I pick on uh, sort of uh, the uh, Merritt's and uh, Schott's paper, famously christened the Race to Zero paper by, uh, by uh, Keith Kreville, and that's because they deal with the different pivotal effects of a vote, uh, and race to zero because both of the probabilities of these effects are supposedly small. Um, but in this particular paper, what they do is they say, look, an elite member looks at the election outcome and uses that to work out where the median voter lives in a future election. So therefore, when people vote, they recognize their change in the inference of the elite as well as change in the outcome. So these are all roles uh, or papers where there's a signal jamming role of election results. So that's one area that this paper is related to.
This is also related to coordination and strategic voting, and also uh, Torin Bruno and I have got work on coordination of activism. And uh, the reason it's related is because we've been looking at things where you, you coordinate. You want to be either in A or in B with other voters, and that's the tactical voting problem. And we have party coordination papers, and essentially this paper uses lots of the same technology. I haven't shown you all the technology because I've just shown you the simple version of the entire model, which is a very simple stripped down version. But it includes that, but puts into what I call an anti-coordination scenario to modern protest voting. Uh, I've only uh, got one minute, so I can just leave you with the take-home messages. Messages are protest votes, they're strategic substitutes, and they react negatively to voters' expectations about the enthusiasm or true enthusiasm for a protest. And that's kind of an interesting dynamic. In particular, it means that an increase in the candidate's popularity can be offset by increased protest voting. I think the candidate's popular, oh, I can get away with protest voting some more. And that kind of breaks the relationship between an election outcome and people's true feelings for a candidate. In particular, if a candidate infers her popularity from the protest vote and responds to it by doing the inference process, then in fact, a rise in her popularity can increase her protest voting by enough to hold her performance to the ballot box. So just because you're doing crappy in the elections doesn't necessarily mean you're unpopular because it's changed the dynamics of people being willing to engage in protest voting. And at least in actions, outcomes might not reflect voters' true support for the protest. It's part of a wider project. We already know that voting is really important. We're going to say, you know, if you can vote for it, I'll study it. I like to study not just what you vote for, but the different reasons you might cast that vote. Not just determining the election, but also communicating with the candidate and changing their policy positions. And so this is where this uh, little paper fits in. That's it.